Hello, everyone. Today, I am joined by Marianne Sunderland, who is a homeschooling mother of eight outside-the-box children ages 10 to 29, including adventurous and homeschooled sailors, Zach and Abby Sunderland, who are known for their world-setting, around-the-world sailing campaigns. So fun. <laughs> Because seven of her eight children are dyslexic, Mary Ann is a passionate dyslexia advocate who wants to educate and encourage families not only to understand dyslexia, but also to discover and nurture their children's God-given gifts and talents in and outside of the classroom. Mary Ann's website, Homeschooling with Dyslexia, provides weekly articles on homeschooling kids with ADD, ADHD, and dyslexia that will bless and encourage you. And I am so delighted to get to talk with you today and hear your perspective. Thanks, Amy. I'm glad to be here. Well, could you just start, Mary Ann, by telling us a little bit about your family and why and how you started homeschooling? Mm -hmm. Actually, um, so... When we first started homeschooling, we were living in Los Angeles. We live in Southern California. And at the time, um, people were talking about like enrolling your infant, like sign your infant up for kindergarten to get into the good schools, you know? And we were like, what? You know, like we, our kids didn't go to preschool. And we just really initially started, wanted to homeschool because we wanted to be with our kids and we wanted to travel um, my husband is British and Australian, so we knew we wanted to go back to Australia. We were thinking of moving there. So we just kind of, when my oldest turned five, we just started homeschooling. <laughs> um, and then over the years, there have been more reasons. You know, your your educational whys change over time. Um, and so it's changed from, you know, having a Christian worldview and wanting to impart that. And then realizing that our kids had learning difficulties um, that, uh, we heard in the schools, they, the schools weren't dealing with him very well. Mm -hmm. So, um, we felt it was better to stay at home. And so we've been homeschooling ever since. Wow. And how did that sort of progression of homeschooling philosophy and approach change over the years? Can you tell us a little bit about how you first realized that your children might have some learning difficulties? Sure. Um, it just made me think of a funny story of our educational philosophy or mine. Um, so gosh, I mean, my oldest, you know, we read a lot and we, there wasn't even TV anyway. I mean, we just didn't watch TV. And so we were just very, you know, we traveled a lot when he was young and read a lot. And so when he was, when he started kindergarten, um, you know, we had fun and then <laughs> I went to my first homeschool conference between his kindergarten and first grade year. And I'm, I'm a total, like, just tell me how many pages to do and I'll do it. I love workbooks and like the stack of like matching textbooks and workbooks. And so I'm walking through this convention hall and I have like the whole curriculum, you know, and the extra seat work and stuff for this kid. And I brought it home and it was like a lead balloon, you know, it was like, um, he just, he, he just had struggled so much with anything that was written or any kind of reading. Um, and so, um, you know, I went from kind of like a school at home, which most people do, um, to more, I think I landed on a Charlotte Mason book at some point. Oh, you know who it was? It was, um, the Moores, Raymond and Dorothy Moore, mm -hmm. um, at, so we had gone to Australia and a friend of my husband's homeschooled their their kids and they gave me a couple of his books to read while we were there. And so I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I, I kind of got this idea of like life could be school. And um, then we got our son tested when he was about seven and the test results came back with all the classics um, markers of dyslexia, which... Like I had no idea dyslexia even existed. It was so crazy to, I mean, I just didn't know. And then um, as we learned more, my husband was like, I think I'm dyslexic. <laughs> and, you know, so then he remembered how much trouble he had growing up. He went to school in England and um, they're very not child-centered, you know, where America might seem very child-centered. He would get the slipper, you know, they would spank him and the ruler and he would get in so much, he would get like hurt at school 
because they would say he wasn't trying. Um, and so then it became even more of a motivation to homeschool because um, my husband kept saying, I don't care how bad business is. He's self-employed. We are homeschooling these kids. We are not putting them in there. He's like, I'd rather live under a bridge and put my kids through what I've been through. So that's, you know, kind of how we, you know, started. Um, and then really the more I learn and the more I experience homeschooling is such a great way to homeschool outside the box kids. Definitely. Well, I would like to talk a little bit about this sort of early warning signs of dyslexia, because I think there can be some confusion. You can have, I go into the Facebook homeschool groups and you have earnest, concerned moms who are homeschooling their little one who's like two or three and can't remember their letters. And they're all worried. And they're like, do you think they have dyslexia? And everyone's telling them, oh, you should go get them tested and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, like, and I'm just like, whoa, okay. Um, my five-year-old still forgets his letters sometimes. So yeah. let's like calm down a little. But at the same time, it can be dismissed where you can have someone who has that mom gut feeling something is just not quite right and people mm -hmm. dismiss it and they say, oh, it's fine. Just keep reading yeah. aloud to them. Like they'll get it eventually. And I kind of see those two extreme reactions, neither of which are really helpful. So if yeah. you're talking to a mom, like how, what are some of the early warning signs of dyslexia and how can we distinguish between maybe a child who's just not quite ready to read because that normal period can, can vary, or someone who maybe needs a little bit more intervention or some extra help? Mm -hmm. So I love that question because um, whenever I, sometimes I'll speak at a homeschool conference and I'll read all the lists of signs of dyslexia and, and I'll see people in the audience like kind of tearing up, like, oh my gosh, I'm dyslexic. Like they didn't realize how many signs there are. Are. And so, you know, yes, people with dyslexia do flip letters and numbers sometimes. Um, that's normal up to about first grade. And then if you're seeing a lot of a sign, um, but in the younger years, uh, it could be delayed speech, although my oldest spoke early, but that's probably because I spent more time with him, you know, than the other kids. Um, also, uh, having difficulty learning say, um, your, your full name, your, um, how old you are, um, learning colors and shapes that can be difficult for kids with dyslexia. Uh, telling time is very difficult. Uh, tying shoes can be difficult. Like I might, I remember my three-year-old putting his arms up to get picked up and saying down, down, you know, <laughs> yeah. like they just, they just mix them up. So yesterday and tomorrow is a very common one. Um, uh, before and after. Uh, so things like, uh, so prepositions are tricky for them. And then one of the telltale signs is not being able to rhyme. So when you said read, read, read to your kids, that's actually a really good thing to do for um, a child who's not school aged. It's really, really good to read a lot to them because what is really going on with young children with um, dyslexia is that they don't have good phonemic awareness. Like they are not able to differentiate the sounds in a word. So if I asked you just say, what are the sounds in cat, you would say k at, right. but a child without phonemic awareness would just not hear different sounds. They would just hear cat. And while that could be common for a younger child without dyslexia, with teaching, it's still hard. Um, and so helping kids to recognize rhyme is really important. So a great thing to do is like get Dr. Seuss books or something with lots of rhyming and read them a lot. And then you leave off the last word that's rhyming and then see if they can fill it in. Um, that's not only is a good phonemic awareness exercise, but it'll help you to see you know, where your child is at. And it's, it's also important to note that dyslexia comes in degrees. So you could be mildly dyslexic, you could be more moderate, and you could be profound. And I have all three, um, like the full range of them. But so, you know, some kids might be able to slide through school uh, with some struggles, but maybe they're able to get by and, um, but usually about maybe fourth, fifth grade, depending on if they're in school or homeschooled, they'll start to hit a lot of walls, uh, especially with spelling. 
Um, spelling is always difficult. There's not a single dyslexic person that spells well without a lot of intervention. <laughs> So I hope that answered your question. That was yeah, a lot of no, that's really helpful. So if a if a parent is noticing some of those maybe warning signs, the lack of phonemic awareness, the rhyming, the prepositions, the the confusion of some of those things, which I think is really helpful to understand that it's not just maybe what we have as a stereotype, you know, seeing letters backwards or something. I think um, there can be some stereotypes about it, and it's it's yeah. broader than that. So we're noticing some of those warning signs. What are some of the first steps we should take to address it with our children and kind of move forward from there to help them? Well, so the first thing, like if your child's school aged or even like four years old, I would get an extensive list of signs of dyslexia. So I have it on my site. You can Google signs of dyslexia and get a, a good list. And so if your child has a lot of the signs, you know, like trouble with telling time and trouble tying their shoes and things like that, like these little signs. And you have a family member, maybe an aunt or an uncle or your husband or your wife, um, grandparent, brother with dyslexia, then it's, it's genetic. So we want to, you know, that's, that's, so we want to, we don't need necessarily need to go in and get tested for dyslexia at a young age. We could talk about maybe when that would be appropriate later, but um, at a young age, if you, if you feel like your child could be dyslexic, they have the signs, there's a dyslexic person in your family, the best thing you can do is get educated about dyslexia. Because kids with dyslexia are smart, sometimes super smart, um, and they have unique strengths and unique weaknesses. In fact, the weaknesses that they have actually cause the strengths. So like they, they're not very detail-oriented at all. But they're only the big picture, but connecting. So they'll connect ideas from science and art or gardening and math. You know, they're just very um, creative that way. Their brains just work differently. And so it's really important to get educated because there's a lot of myths about dyslexia, like that they're not, they're just not smart. And that's just not true. Um, but if a child grows up struggling in school, and there's no reason that they can think of, then they just assume they're dumb. So I feel like for parents, the best thing you can do is to learn as much as you can about dyslexia and understand your child so you can teach them the way they learn because there's, there's uh, modifications that you can make. You know, you can listen, they can listen to audiobooks. You can delay teaching spelling until they're reading better and delay teaching writing, you know. Um, there's so many ways to nurture their strengths while allowing their weaknesses to grow gradually. Cause they do, they all learn to read, you know, unless they don't get any instruction. Do you know what I mean? So you got to get educated, take a deep breath, you know, <laughs> because they're, they're smart, but they're different. And so you, you gotta, if you're not familiar with it, you know, you need to relearn some things. Yeah. I think that's really important just to kind of start not to freak out and, and start thinking of all the what ifs, but start just by educating yourself as the homeschool parent. Mm -hmm. And then you understand your child better. And yeah. for any child, neurotypical and neurodiverse, like understanding them and the way they think and process in their own unique strengths and weaknesses can only make you a better, well, not only homeschool teacher, but parent too. It helps you yes. mentor them through that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You, you mentioned a little bit about some of the misconceptions about dyslexia. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, we talked about the intelligence. I think that's the first one um, or the most common one. Another one would be that they're not trying because mm -hmm. uh, as a teacher or parent, you can see that they're intelligent. They can communicate, they understand things, but maybe when they're writing, taking a spelling test or taking a test or, um, staying focused. ADD is very common with dyslexia. Um, it can look like they're not trying hard and that's trying harder than everybody else. You know, they're trying so hard to keep up and so hard to pay attention because they, most kids want to do well. They want to please their teachers. So that's really important. Um, you know, it's not caused by junk food or, you know, watching bat too much TV, 
um, not caused by vaccinations. You know, it's genetic. So it is passed down, um, you know, within families. So um, that's a nice way to actually um, encourage kids, you know, if grandpa's got dyslexia or dad has dyslexia and he's done well, you know, it encourages them. Um, I'm trying to think of some other ones. There's, there's um, you know, there's no vitamins you can take to cure it. You know, it's, it's, it's a, um, it's a difference in brain wiring. So back in the early nineties, um, Sally Shaywitz, she wrote the, the epic book called Overcoming Dyslexia. And she did a bunch of research out of, I think she's at Stanford or Harvard, Stanford. And anyway, they did a functional MRI. So they scanned the brains of people while they were reading. And what they found was people who are you know, normal readers, there, the input would go in through the eyes and go right to the reading center of the brain. Whereas the dyslexic readers or the, the weaker readers, they would read and the input would come in the eyes and then it would go all over the place and then get to the reading center of the brain. Yeah. So then this is crazy. They, this is the whole idea of neuroplasticity that brains can change. They studied some brains of children who were given the Orton-Gillingham method of teaching reading, which is like multi-sensory, systematic. Um, that's your all about reading, your Barton, Logic of English, Reading Horizons. They are all Orton-Gillingham based. Uh, it's, like, it's like it was designed by some early educators and it just really works. But when they followed these children for like six months and they had it, this tutoring like maybe three days a week for an hour a day, the, the brain wiring actually changed in their brains. So when the input went in, it was going directly to the reading center of the brain. So um, children with dyslexia can learn to read. It's, it's not that they're disabled. I don't use that word anymore. And I know there's different nuances to it, but it's a learning difference, I strongly believe. Um, and so we need to, that's why homeschooling is so awesome, because we can know that and we can modify things to meet our kids' needs. I love that. And it's so fascinating just to hear about the way the brain works and is designed and can change mm -hmm. and grow. Um, that's just fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Well, Marianne, how can we, how can we take some of these strengths? You talked earlier about how a dyslexic kid has a weakness, but it's actually like because they have this different set of strengths. How can we teach to those strengths and encourage a love of learning, even if some of their learning is more challenging? Um, and how can, you know, what does that look like <laughs> in, a, in a normal, yeah. regular family? How, what does that look like in your family? So I do believe that it's important to teach reading to children when they're young. So what I believe that it's important, it's considered early intervention. So I believe it is important to use an Orton-Gillingham program or hire an Orton-Gillingham tutor of some sort to, to teach your dyslexic kids. Because like most kids will learn to read eventually. Like I have one child who's not dyslexic and she's like number, what number is she? <laughs> she's number six. Yeah. And like I would give her Bob, uh, not Bob books, uh, explode the code books, you know, and, and she like would do these because she loved workbooks and she learned to read from doing explode the code. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Like all of a sudden she's like, look, mom, I can read. And I actually cried. I went in my room and I cried and I was in a funk for like two weeks. I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like that's how kids learn to read. Oh, wow. <laughs> because honestly, like children with dyslexia, even with good intervention might not read independently till 10, 11, 12, 13. So, you know, um, but they do. Um, so I'm sorry, your question, what, what was your question? I got off on a tangent. No, that was a great tangent. I loved it. But my, my question was about encouraging the love of learning and to yeah. their strengths while mm -hmm. they have these other challenges, but playing to the strengths. Yes. So what we tend to do, like, we'll, we'll do lots of read alouds or listening to books, but I uh, just observe them and try to find out what they're interested in. So, um, one of my sons was really into sharks for a long time. And so, you know, we would get books on sharks and watch videos on sharks. And, um, he would write, like do copy work about sharks. And, um, he would 
that interest of his would cause him to want to read books. It would want him to, you know, we go different places like, like aquariums around and it just, it's like this, they're sponges. And so that it's interesting to them. But if I sat him down and had him, you know, well, we're, we're not studying sharks, you know, we're studying the geological rock for formations or whatever, you know, and made it. So, so that's one thing, um, using interests. Um, there's also, there's a, um, uh, I don't know if it's a theory, an educational theory, but it's multiple intelligences. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. So um, Kathy Koch, or Koch, she's a Christian writer who wrote Eight Great Smarts. And then there's another guy, um, it's a yellow book. And it was like, how am I smart? But that, I have found a lot of truth in, in the idea of these eight strengths. I see it in all of my kids. So for example, one of my sons, is very people oriented, um, very social. Like, and I'm I'm not particularly, but um, like he would go to Boy Scout camp, and he had a little composition book, and he would write down everybody's phone numbers. And then when he got older, and he um, got a phone, you know, or got Facebook or whatever, he would contact them. And then if he was in San Diego for some reason, he'd contact them. Like he's brilliant, and he is a he. Um, so for him, being social and being in groups and learning together was important. Um, and now he's a super successful entrepreneur, like, and that's his strength. Like he, he connects people and sells things to them. Um, one of my kids was really into animals and um, she's number two. And so I had all these kids, you know, and we'd get these books at the library and I, couldn't, I didn't really have time to read them to her, but she would, or I would start them, but not finish, which is actually a good strategy because it gets mm -hmm. them kind of hooked. And then, <laughs> they have to, but she basically taught herself. I mean, she, we were doing reading instruction, but she like persevered because she wanted the information. So I encourage, um, I encourage letting kids follow their interests and then as you observe them, like they might want to, like a lot of my kids have been business oriented. So they'll not only do they like to bake, but they want to sell them at park day, you know, sell the stuff at park day and um, just kind of observing those things and then facilitating them because um, there's a pro like, you know, when the kids get to be like the tweeny age and if they're not, they're not good at something if there's not something that they can be proud of, it can be a very difficult stage of life, you know, because that's when to other kids. And, you know, if they're just like taking classes and they're struggling all the time or their whole life is defined by their struggle, you know, it can be a really kind of depressing wake up call <laughs> when you're starting to go, well, what am I good at? So um, I think pursuing interests and, and allowing that to guide your, your extracurricular or your you know, I do reading and math with my kids. I'm not a full on unschooler, but other than that, I like to let facilitate their learning and other things to keep them motiv motivated. Yeah. I have found with my own children too, like each of them has their own area that's a challenge, right? And so to try to balance out even of a week or even a day to try to make sure like everything isn't super, super hard that, okay, you have one, one thing maybe that's challenging that you have to really work hard and it's not the most fun thing in the world. Um, but not to have everything have that same weight yeah. of a burden. I remember a couple of years ago, one of my daughters who was a later reader and it's just harder for her. It's more work. Some of the other children, they can just read and read and read, but for her, it feels like work. Mm -hmm. And we had a math program I had used with the older students. And I was like, we already have it. Save money. You'll be fine. Like you're good at math. This will be fine. But it was, had so many words on the page that she would get exhausted just trying to read the words. So by the time she got to the math, her brain and her emotions were just overwhelmed. And yeah. she started crying like every day. And she was like, I hate math. She had always loved math. Like she's really good at it. And I was like, this is no, we're not doing this. Yeah. So I would sit with her and just read the math lesson out loud to her because I wanted her to be able to focus on the actual subjects that it was, not get distracted by the reading part, you know? Right. That's a great example of um, an accommodation. So an accommodation is um, 
something that allows your child to learn at their intellectual ability, despite like having trouble with that much reading. Um, so audiobooks is a fantastic way. I remember my oldest son doing, I don't know if it was physical science or biology or something. And the vocabulary was so difficult. Like there's so many words he didn't know and concepts he didn't know. And he was really struggling. And then uh, it was Apologia Biology and they have the MP3, you can actually buy it. And as soon as he started listening to it, it was like, it was like, oh, okay. And it was such a beautiful thing because he's so smart, but he was really hindered by having to read with his eyes. But reading, they call it ear reading, you know, if you're reading with your ears, what's the difference? What's the purpose? You know, people will say, oh, well, that's not fair. I mean, I kind of was on that on that bandwagon for a while, like that's cheating. And like, I would, my, my son, um, well, he's 23. Um, the one who's super social and was so, had so much trouble in school. Um, he was, he's an Eagle Scout and I, but to be an Eagle Scout, you have to do your project and you have to, um, create this whole binder full of like documentation of your project and stuff. And I was like, dude, if you're going to be an Eagle Scout, you're going to have to type this yourself, you know? And, and he was like, but mom, I can't spell it. And I was like, well, type it into Microsoft Word and get the corrections. And like, I was going to make it really, really hard for him. And his tutor was like, oh, are you kidding me? And then I talked to all these other parents who were like, oh, I totally typed his stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, so, you know, I, 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 I don't know that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like he, he organized his project. He, he really earned it. You know, he was, he organized it. He was detailed. He, you know, he did a fantastic job with the whole thing, not being able to document it really well. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, totally. Well, you know, Milton was blind when he wrote Paradise Lost. So he dictated it to his daughters. And so I just think about that all the time. I mean, that's yes. looked on as one of the great pieces of English literature and he didn't mm -hmm. actually do the physical writing it out by hand himself. Yeah. So I think we'll be okay if we help our kids along the yeah. way. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, Marianne, I'm asking these two questions to all of my guests this season. And the first one is just, what are you personally reading lately? It's funny that you should ask because I, I was looking for my book before we talked, but I'm reading this book called Unschooled by Carrie McDonald. Uh, the subtitle is uh, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. And I started reading it um, online. Like I have a subscription to Scrib Scribed or Scribbed, Scribed, I think. Um, and so you could get all kinds of books, you know, for free or for that monthly fee. And so I started reading it and it was so good. Uh, I'm always fascinated with unschooling. I don't think I'll ever be like, I don't, I'm just, I'm like not convinced my kids would ever want to do math, you know, <laughs> so right. I'm like, we're just going to do math and reading, but then you can unschool. So that it's, it's a fantastic book because it has a lot of research um, on like how the benefits of doing, um, you know, really interest led learning is what it's about. Oh, that sounds really fascinating. Yeah. I've, so we mm -hmm. follow more of a restful classical approach to education, but part of that is I leave plenty of just white space in the day. So I feel like that's the time or then in the summer, I jokingly call my summer, my unschool days. Cause it's just there like, learn, do whatever you want to do for your yeah. interests. I mean, granted some of my children, that just means a lot of Ninjago, but you know, I'm sure they're learning something. <laughs> totally. One of my sons learned a lot about history from, I can't remember the game he played. It was on the computer, but it, it was like a, you know, you'd build a t an army and then you'd go and you'd invade, but there was all this history and he loved history. Uh, and then, and you know what? He had to type words in like to communicate. And he said he learned how to spell really well from, <laughs> from playing this video game. So, so oh, well. sneaky. We can't tell them what they're learning. <laughs> Well, the final question I have for you is what tip would you give to that homeschool mom when the day just seems to be going completely off the rails? Um, I would definitely say to stop and go outside. Um, that is something that just, I, I, my husband, I used to talk to my husband. And I'd be like, I just can't, I don't he'd say, honey, just like stop schooling, you know, and go to the beach. We live near the beach. And I was like, we can't go to the beach. 
like we're behind, you know? And then eventually it would be so bad that it was like, okay, we're going to the beach and we'd go. And it was like, everybody had space and we just kind of, it kind of refocuses you on like, oh, I guess des learning decimals isn't like that important. <laughs> you know? It's not the end of the world today. Right. <laughs> we can try again tomorrow and it'll be okay. Well, unfortunately, not all of us can go to the beach, but maybe we can go to the woods or... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just getting outside. I just ate lunch outside today and I was like, oh, I really just needed to go outside. <laughs> I think sometimes mom needs the to go outside too. Out here. <laughs> well, Marianne, where can people find you all around the internet? So I think the main place to find me is at my website, homeschoolingwithdyslexia.com. And there's a lot of um, free resources there. Uh, I have some parent classes, some parent education classes that are great if you're just getting started and you want, like, just give me that what I need to know, you know. Um, uh, and I have a little group um, called Beyond the Box Learning, and that's actually where we're reading Unschooled. So we're... We, can, we have speakers and we have um, live chat. We have chats once a month where we get together and talk. And we're, it's just a group of people who are kind of still learning and wanting a, a community, I guess you could call it. So, but that's, I'm on Facebook and Instagram, but not that much. Okay. Well, I will have links to those things okay. over at the show notes for, for this episode at humilityanddoxology.com. Thank you, Mary Ann, very much for chatting today. My pleasure.